And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter. Like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring, or observing, which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function 
simply by observing. However, the double hole experiment's mind-boggling conclusions don't end there. In recent years, technology has allowed scientists to perform a fascinating variation of the test. Its results call into question our perception of time itself. This is like a high-tech version of the double hole experiment. Electrons are being fired toward a barrier with two holes in it. But the scientists can delay their decision about whether to observe the electrons until after they've passed through the holes, but before they hit the screen. It's as though I'm on a baseball field, and there's a baseball being pitched toward the barrier with the holes in it. But my eyes are closed, so it goes through, and it behaves like a wave. But then, at the last second before it hits the screen, I open my eyes and decide to observe it. At that moment, the electrons, in essence, become particles, and seemingly always were particles from the time they left the electron gun. So it's as though they went back in time to before they went through the holes and decided to go through one or the other, not through both as they would have had they been behaving like waves. That's really crazy. That's the enigma that our choice of what experiment to do determines the prior state of the electron. Somehow or other, we've had an influence on it which appears to travel backwards in time. The experiment begins in the top left corner with the laser firing two entangled photons either through slit A or slit B. Now it is truly random which slit it will fire through. And because we have no measuring device at either slit, we cannot know which slit the laser fires through until they pass through and are detected on the other side. So at each firing, it will either go through A or B. Now the first prism splits the entangled photon. This is how it works. When two subatomic particles interact, they can become entangled. That means their spin, position, or other properties become linked through a process unknown to modern science. If you then make a measurement of one of the particles, then that instantaneously determines what the behavior of the other particle should be. And when the experiment is done, it's found that indeed the other particle's quantum state is exactly determined once you've made a measurement of the partner particle's quantum state. Now the first prism splits the entangled photons and sends them in different directions. The top one goes to detector zero. Now if the photons only hit D zero, we don't know the path information, since when the photon arrives, it could have either come from path A or path B. So because we don't know the path information, it should produce an interference pattern, if it only came here. If we could place a measuring device at the slit, we would know the path information. But with just a result from D0, we don't know the path information. So because of the lack of knowledge we would have about the system, the particle would act in a way as if it goes through both becoming the wave of possibilities it could have been, instead of one of these possibilities, if we knew the definite path information. But the other entangled photon goes the other way, and because it is entangled, it will affect the result of its twin that went to D0. Now the other photon from either A or B goes through the prism and hits either BSA or BSB. At both of these, there is a 50-50 chance it will either pass through or bounce off and go to either D4 or D3. Now if the photon hits either one of these detectors, notice what happens. We obtain which path information. Because the only way the photon could hit D3 is if it came out of B. And the only way it could hit D4 is if it came out of A. There is no way a photon that came out of B could hit D4 and vice versa. So if a photon hits D3 or D4, we will know the path information it took and we will get a clump pattern. Now if the photon randomly passes through BSA or BSB, it will either bounce off here or here, and it has a 50-50 chance of passing through BSC or bouncing off of it. So if the photon passes through BSA or BSB, we lose the path information. Because if it hits D1 or D2, it could either have come from A or B. We can't ever trace the path information back to A or B. So when they hit D1 or D2, we should get an interference pattern, demonstrating the photon went through both slits, since we don't have definite path information. 
Now here is one of the important implications of this experiment about what is causing collapse. Some argue physical interaction from the detector is what is causing the collapse, but if that was the case, D1 and D2 should cause collapse every time. But that is not what happens. If a photon makes it to D1 or D2, they always display an interference pattern. Yet every time a photon hits D3 or D4, a clump pattern is formed. But the only difference is what we, the observers, know about these two stations. Because of the experiment setup, we know that if a photon hits D3, it will always be a clump pattern, showing the photon only went through one slit. If it hits D1, we know it will always be an interference pattern, showing that the photon acted in a way as if it went through both slits. But the only difference between these two is what we, the conscious observer, knows about the system. Our knowledge of the system causes different results in how the photon will act. If it was all random and not caused by our knowledge, we should get some clump patterns at D1 and some interference patterns at D3, but that is not what the experiment shows. We always get a clump pattern at D3 and D4 because whenever a photon hits here, we always know the path information, and we always will get an interference pattern at D1 and D2 because we can never know the actual path information. So the photon acts in a way as if it goes through both, whereas at D3 and D4, the photon only goes through one slit because we know the path information. The particles act in a way that correlates to our knowledge. See, what causes collapse is knowledge, and knowledge requires a knower. Sir Rudolf Peirce said, the moment at which you can throw away one possibility and keep only the other is when you finally become conscious of the fact that the experiment has given one result. You see, the quantum mechanical descriptions is in terms of knowledge, and knowledge requires somebody who knows. Now the other implication is even more mind-boggling because the photon knew beforehand where it would end up. How do we know this? Because of how its twin acts at D0. The twin photon registers at D0 before its entangled twin ends up at a detector, and whatever registers at D0 always correlates to wherever its twin ends up. So if the twin hits D3 or D4, D0 always registers a clump pattern to correlate, and always an interference pattern if its twin lands at D1 or D2. I don't understand it. I don't know that anyone does. 